Time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. Highness. The Anarcho-Christian Podcast, evaluating the relationship between the Christian and the state. Give us a king to rule us when you're gone. His life's work had been to help the people understand. It's not the role of a man to rule over other men. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Today, we will be reviewing a passage I like to call the Other Romans 13, which is also known as 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14. The language between the two passages, Romans 13, 1 through 7, and 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14, are so similar that in the past, I've taken the easy opportunity to just point to the more popular text of Romans 13 when asked about 1 Peter 2. While I don't think that there is anything wrong with that, because the texts are so similar, and obviously do not contradict, I do think we miss out on some really cool details that actually help us in our overall understanding of both passages. So today, I will try to fix that, and let's just get into it. The two verses in question read as follows. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. As you may be able to tell, it does sound very much like Romans 13, specifically verse 1 that says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. In verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. All right, there it is. I think you can see why I normally just point to a good understanding of Romans 13. It's seven verses compared to the two, which is more to get through, but I think it gives us a better idea of what these apostles were trying to convey to the early church. And maybe more to the point, Romans 13 is just the more popular passage to point to for believers and unbelievers. But as I said, let's give this passage its due attention. Being shorter and less popular shouldn't deter us from answering the questions surrounding it. First thing first, context. And there are two things I think we should keep in mind with the context of this passage. I've discussed it before, and it's always a good reminder, but we will hardly ever get the accurate meaning of a verse from reading it all alone. Some of the worst forms of false doctrine come from just that, picking one verse out of the Bible and then building a complex doctrine or understanding off of it alone. Most of the time when we do this, the habit is to start inserting our own assumptions. Then. We build assumptions on top of assumptions and end up way off from the original message. And we end up teaching it all as if it's this ultimate truth. So the two things we need to keep in mind are the literary context and the historical context. The literary context is keeping in mind what Peter is saying in his letter. And the historical context is when it was written, who wrote it, and who it was written to. When we examine these contexts, it becomes very difficult to get the statist interpretation that is so prevalent when these verses are isolated. Now, when I bring up Romans 13 and the different interpretations, we usually land with the three common categories, the statist, the tool, and the righteous government. The statist category is essentially the state must be followed unconditionally. Of course, this gets into a whole host of contradictions that I'm sure you're already aware of. But namely, 
the person holding this interpretation demands the unconditional support when it's their guy that's in office, but will usually have a lot to say when it's the other party's guy in office. The other two positions are what you commonly find among Christian anarchist circles. The tool position is essentially saying that God uses all governments to bring about his glory, be those governments good or bad, by our standards. The righteous government interprets Romans 13 as a set of standards for governments to follow. The next two are not as common. Some say Romans 13 is exclusively talking about the church, and others think this section of Romans 13, or Paul's writings altogether, need to be ignored and removed from Scripture. If you've listened to this podcast for any length of time, you'll know that I agree with the tool interpretation. If you visit anarchochristian.com slash Romans 13, you'll see an archive of other episodes that go over that interpretation in more detail, as well as other resources and book recommendations. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. So one important thing to consider, regardless of our specific interpretation, is the historical context of Romans 13. Let's not forget where and when it was written, and details about Paul. My apologetic study Bible writes in the intro to the book of Romans that Paul wrote the letter to the church in Rome, quote, while staying in Corinth during his third missionary journey in AD 57, end quote, which is noted in Acts chapter 20, verse 2 and 3. We know that Nero was the emperor of Rome from 54 to 68 AD and persecuted Christians during his reign, even blaming them for the fire that consumed a lot of Rome during AD 64. We have three accounts recorded in the New Testament of Paul being arrested during his 35-year ministry before his execution by the Roman Empire in 68 AD. Peter was also executed during the time of Nero. Church tradition tells us it was sometime between the Great Fire of 64 and the end of Nero's reign in 68. I reference Fox's Book of Martyrs quite a bit, and he documented both Peter and Paul's executions. He records that the first of these ten persecutions was stirred up by Nero about the year of our Lord threescore and four, the tyrannous rage of which emperor was very fierce against the Christians. He then quotes a recording from Isubius that describes cities full of bodies of men, women, and children, old and young, laying out in the open streets. He then tells us, In this persecution, among many other saints, the blessed Apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do write, at Rome. Albeit, some others, and not without cause, do doubt thereof. Hegesippus saith that Nero sought matters against Peter to put him to death, which, when the people perceived, they entreated Peter, with much ado, that he would fly the city. Peter, through their importunity, at length persuaded, prepared himself to avoid, but coming to the gate, he saw the Lord Christ come to meet him, to whom he, worshipping, said, Lord, whither dost thou go? To whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter, perceiving his suffering to be understood, returned back into the city. Jerome saith that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, himself so requiring, because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified after the same form and manner as the Lord was. Paul, the apostle, who before was called Saul, after his great travail and unspeakable labors in promoting the gospel of Christ, suffered also in this first persecution under Nero. Abdias declareth that unto his execution Nero sent two of his esquires, Ferega and Parthemius, to bring him word of his death. They, coming to Paul, instructing the people, desired him to pray for them, that they might believe who told them that shortly after they should believe and be baptized at his sepulchre. 
This done, the soldiers came and led him out of the city to the place of execution, where he, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. So that was Fox's writings about Peter and Paul. Peter was crucified upside down, and Paul was beheaded, and both willingly and peacefully, around the same time, under the same emperor. I think this is important when trying to get an idea of what these guys were saying in their letters that are so disputed today. It shows us that the historical context of 1 Peter is similar to Romans. And although there is some dispute if Peter wrote 2 Peter, there is less dispute about the authorship of 1 Peter. The first verse of 1 Peter states who wrote it and who it was written to. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the temporary residents of the dispersion in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So, Romans was written to the Church of Rome. And if you're not familiar, all of those provinces Peter mentions are found in modern-day Turkey, which was part of the Roman Empire at the time. The remainder of the first chapter of 1 Peter, we see Peter encouraging the readers by reminding them of the living hope they have through the resurrection. He then reminds them throughout the rest of the first chapter and into the second to be holy and rid themselves of things like wickedness and deceit. This is where we also find the verses we already went over in our episode on God's nation, describing Christians as a holy race and chosen nation. Then, by the 11th verse, we get closer to the verses in question. Numbers 13 and 14. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, Honor the emperor. So, for this to be in any way like the statist version of Romans 13, I think it is interesting that we are referring to people that are separate from the governing authorities. To be subject to these institutions is another way of saying to be under subjugation. And subjugation is definitely not what comes to mind when we think about a government that we are a part of or pledging allegiance to. The language is always as something separate to the faithful. And to add to the tool interpretation, even above the righteous government interpretation, we see in the remainder of the chapter these very difficult words. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. The last words here, also to the unjust, are what is very difficult for the righteous government interpretation to get behind. How can you be righteous and unjust? This is why the tool interpretation is the way we should be looking at Romans 13, 1 Peter, and, well, government in general. But if you're still not sure, we can continue reading. Verse 19. For this is a gracious thing, when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Again, we can't suffer unjustly in a good state or righteous government. But why is this? Like I mentioned in the Romans 13 explanation in the No King But Christ episode, historically, we see the church thriving under persecution. Be it what we read about under Nero, bodies piled in the streets of multiple cities across the empire, or contemporary tales of Chinese nationals interned and tortured in China. But Peter has words of encouragement there too. Picking up again with verse 20. For what credit is it if, 
when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So it's interesting that Peter and Paul were so similar here. Sometimes we see people denigrate Paul for what they think Romans 13 says. Essentially, it's an agreement with the statist that Romans 13 has a statist meaning. But they don't support that. So this is where you see people reject Romans 13 and Paul altogether. But not only did Peter agree with Paul over the use of unjust governments by God to bring about his glory, but he even tells his readers in 2 Peter 3.16, Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. This is a big deal. And to reiterate or sum up, Peter is saying Paul's words may be difficult to understand sometimes, but they should be looked at with as much sacred reverence as you do the Torah or other words from the prophets. Essentially, what we call the Old Testament. And all of this agreement is especially interesting when you see that these guys didn't always get along. And it was common knowledge in the church because they wrote about it. <laughs> it brings a lot of credibility to the claims that these letters were written over a long period of time from multiple authors, rather than something that was all written by one or a few guys to spin a fairy tale for everyone to easily believe. In Galatians 2, 11 through 13, Paul explains this incident. But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face, for what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers, who were not circumcised. But afterward, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So what Paul is saying is that Peter was good with eating and hanging out with the Gentiles until Christians of Jewish descent, who were holding to a lot of the Jewish customs and laws, would come around, and then Peter would ignore the Gentiles and hang out only with the Jewish believers. But all that to say, these two men, even with tense moments, worked out their differences and had a consistent message, not only with the gospel, but with what we are talking about today, the role of government, God's use of it, and the Christian's relation to it. So what do y'all think? Does it make sense? Does it challenge some previously held ideas about this passage or even Romans 13? While you're thinking on it, let's review a couple other options out there from names we tend to look to on this podcast. Y'all know that David Lipscomb is my go-to guy for giving a really thorough and biblical explanation of civil government and the Christian's relation to it. In his book, Civil Government, after his explanation of a proper understanding of Romans 13, he also draws the parallel to Paul's words in Romans 12 and Peter's words 
at the end of 1 Peter. He points out that the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 19-21 reiterated the principles of the Sermon on the Mount. He then reiterates that passage in 1 Peter 2, 19-24. He presents the KJV, but I'm going to read it in the ESV because I'm pretty terrible at the King's English. <laughs> Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So that was Romans 13, and this is 1 Peter 2. 19 through 24. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. There are just so many parallels to Peter's and Paul's words, it really puts to rest the accusations that they had a conflicting message. But Jacques Ellul is a popular voice in Christian anarchism, and he has a different perspective. In his book, Anarchy and Christianity, he calls 1 Peter 2.13 a strange passage. From what I can tell, the translations are split between two different words, some using emperor in verse 13 and 17, and some using king instead. The original Greek word in question is, and I apologize, but I'm, I'll try my best to pronounce this, basileus. According to Strong's Concordance, it is used 115 times in the New Testament. Sometimes it is translated as king, and sometimes emperor. But of course, that is going to vary by the translation you are using. I think emperor is chosen for this passage as it is historically relevant to what Peter is saying, and as we've gone over, I think that would be accurate. But Elul challenges that and spends a couple of pages explaining what sort of kings Peter may have been referring to. He says that Augustus was careful to not hint to anything like a monarchy, and that the Roman emperors never took the title king. He then points out the only unconquered enemy of Rome at this time were the Parthians. And they had a king. He then theorizes that this was an intentional subversion to Rome. This support for another political power showed refusal to recognize the validity of political power or the repudiation of political power or specifically the condemnation of Roman power. This is interesting and the idea of not supporting Rome is valid, but even if you go back and plug Parthian king into verses 13 and 17, the anarchist is still going to have trouble getting a revolutionary message out of this. Try it out. Be subject to the Parthian king as supreme, and honor the Parthian king. I think someone looking to this interpretation is looking for an actively anti-Caesar message but you end up placing the apostles and the early church under the kingship of another. By making this about being actively in favor of another king for whatever subversive reasons, we are losing the overall message from this entire passage that puts Christians at a peaceful opposition with Rome, and Peter's parallels to the unjust suffering of Christians with the sufferings of Christ. Obviously, I don't agree, but it's the only other interpretation attempt I've seen out there, and with Elul being such a popular name in our circles, I don't think it would have been right to not include it. It's worth looking at, even if we don't agree. If you're interested in picking up Elul's book, 
I will have links to it and the other books I've recommended in the show notes. So there you have it. The three different presentations of 1 Peter 2. The status interpretation that isolates phrases like honor the king and emperor to demand support or allegiance for whatever current leader we're talking about. The tool interpretation continued from our reading of Romans 13. And the alternate anarchist perspective from Elul. Time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. The clip I played at the front of the episode is from the movie Gladiator, and I think it is something to think on as we consider honoring the emperor while being in subjugation. In the scene, we see Maximus standing in the arena face to face with the emperor, Commodus. Commodus is trying to provoke Maximus to lash out at him by saying some awful and mocking things about his murdered family. And in a great show of restraint, Maximus responds simply, The time for honoring yourself will soon be at an end. He then bows his head and calls him Highness. This is a fictional illustration, but this sort of response silenced and enraged the emperor. In our passage today, Peter said, By doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. And Paul said in Romans 12 that caring for your enemy is like heaping burning coals on his head. This may be an extreme example of that subjugation and a small example of showing honor, but this, I believe, can illustrate that tension that Peter and Paul are experiencing, explaining, and encouraging within the church. But what do you think about it? What do you think about Peter and the other Romans 13? Let me know on social media. Did this episode change your mind or just add to the confusion? It may be a lot to consider, but I hope it helps. Being a couple thousand years removed from these events, sometimes it takes a little time and thought to understand what these writers were saying. And that's not to mention all of the varying opinions and teachings that have sprung up in that time and compete for the position of truth. Even from the epistles in the New Testament, we can see that there has been doctrinal arguments from the moment Jesus ascended. So don't lose heart. Be encouraged that we have these scriptures to study and God's promises that he will reveal the truth to us through his Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't forget to subscribe to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast on whatever podcast you're using. If you're not sure where to find us, visit anarchochristian.com slash subscribe. There you'll find links to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Android, Google Play, and YouTube. If you're enjoying the podcast, please consider letting us know by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Also, like and share the episode on Facebook or the other social media sites. You can support this show with a monthly donation through Patreon or Subscribestar or a one-time donation through PayPal. You can visit us on those sites, or you can visit the Support the Show tab on anarchochristian.com. That will take you to a page where you'll find the links to Patreon, Subscribestar, and PayPal. Thank you to our newest patron, Ephraim. I really appreciate your support. So I think that's it for today. Grace and peace. No King but Christ. Thank you for listening to the Anarcho-Christian Podcast. Subscribe to our email notifications at anarchochristian.com. Like us on facebook.com backslash anarchochristian. And follow us on Twitter at anarchoxp.
Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube to join us next time as we continue to evaluate the relationship between the Christian and the state. No king but Christ.